And welcome to What Makes a Difference. We're talking with Tony Wright, CEO and founder of Ford Assist. And we're talking about moral injury and military sexual trauma. Thank you for sparing us your time. Thank you, Tony. I know you're a very busy man. Thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. Sometimes I wonder if I'm just a lone voice shouting into the wilderness saying we must do more. And uh, I think if your series has been already been around moral injury, then the links with military sexual trauma and moral in, uh, moral injury are, 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 are very very connected. So we need to uh, we need to embrace uh, both terms and uh, raise awareness what they mean and how they can affect people. And so this is a great opportunity. And I, and I thank you for letting me on here to talk about my work. That we've been doing initially with women, the LGBT community, and uh, more likely, men. You're very welcome, Tony. I think, Ali, doesn't it, this ties in quite nicely with what the work Dr Dan Roberts does? Very much. Uh -huh. I mean, we've spoken with Dr Dan Roberts about military sexual trauma, particularly with, with women. But there is a huge element, because Dr Dan Roberts' area is moral injury, of moral injury with that. And I think that's where sometimes that gets missed in the conversation. Mm. It's hard enough having a conversation about military sexual trauma, regardless of gender, but what's not taken consideration is the, is the additional layer of that moral injury, the potential for that moral injury within there. And I'm just conscious that probably a lot of people listening are going, well, how do you figure that one? Mm. Yeah, and it, that that is interesting because a lot of people... If you look at a lot of the research that's knocking about the minute, it's very much making a correlation between uh, active service and combat mm -hmm. uh, and moral injury or moral injury in the NHS during the COVID period, yeah. uh, which, which again was fascinating because suddenly uh, we had 15 million people, I think the estimate was in the country, suddenly acquired post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of COVID and the subsequent lockdowns and restrictions, all of which is very understandable. So that 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 was really interesting, but nobody really talks about moral injury as a result of military sexual trauma. And so that so yeah, so I, it it is a it's it's a murky subject if you like, but one that needs to be discussed and I think fully and very openly. What does your organisation do, please, Tony? Well, okay, well, it's forward assist. Well, when did we establish forward assist? Two thousand and twelve. So I had a chari I had a. Uh, an organisation that was a community interest for about five years before that. We were then looking at like. Uh, it was very much used in my past skills and abilities and abilities. <laughs> my skills, really, and my profession, which was uh, looking at people who were in the criminal justice system or it was people who were uh, in the grips of some sort of substance or alcohol misuse problem. So we were, we were on, it was like, this. it was called About Turn. It was About Turn on the road to addictions and it was About Turn on the road to the criminal justice system. So it was looking at how people could take control of their lives. And we did that for a few years until I went to America uh, on a Winston Church Memorial Trust Fellowship, went there and went, wow, I've got this a bit wrong. Do you know what I mean? Basically, I'm pimping me and I'm not hitting the bigger market. And I came back from there and went, yeah, we need to set something up that actually looks at the real reintegration into life and citizenship and the roles of veterans. And so I started off with a pretty much scattergun approach to services. So it was anything that engaged the people I was already working with or anyone who was coming through. And we've evolved over the years. Now we're in our second decade. And strange enough, there's so many charities come up over the last 10 years that I don't need to do what I used to do. And if I was to do it, I'd be replicating all the, you know, the equally important engagement work with veterans on the at the grassroots level. So I don't do that anymore. I focus on males, survivors of military sexual assault and, and MST, or the lack of MST as a term. Veterans retreats, therapeutic retreats, uh, which can either be abstinence-based or don't have to be, depending on who, the makeup of the group, and teaching veterans communication skills by teaching them um, 
debating skills, British parliamentary debating skills. So for this year onwards, that's what I'm concentrating on predominantly. That's what I'm going to be doing. And anything else, so I've turned into I've turned into the, the very person I never wanted to be, which I signpost people now, but I know the organisations they're going to do, so I'm pretty confident that I can pick the right organisations with the right people for the right issues that are being presented. Although I used to be a big critic of refer-on organisations, yeah. so I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> well, I think sometimes the challenge is recognising that we can't be all things and actually maybe the biggest benefit we can be is for that specialist arena where we get to specialise, we get to develop that expertise and that support because otherwise it, it still remains quite general. Yeah, and, I, and I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, I, I'm a big, I think what we don't do particularly well in this country is we don't collaborate in, in the way we should. So I make referrals and uh, I check in that they get there. But I, I do think we could be working much more proactively on that. And I, and I personally, you're right, as a, as a social worker who's been doing this sort of work for a long time, working with the, the excluded and the disenfranchised for a, horrendous amount of years and I'm I'm more confident focusing on two or three uh, topics and areas than I was potentially trying to spin about 15 plates at any one time so there's you know we're currently writing a research report and so that so the the quality that's gone into that because I've had a year to do it is I'm, I'm re- even though I'm I'm still a month out from finishing I'm really happy with what the the areas we've covered purely by it being able to focus in on what really matters and go away and consider it and think, is that worth keeping? Is it not? So, yeah, I agree, Mom. Yeah. So we've been in conversation on and off over the last few weeks, months, about some of the topics that I know are very close to your heart, Tony. And one of those which is particularly underrepresented and talked about is military sexual trauma in relation to to men. Mm-hmm. It's almost kind of like swept under the carpet and not acknowledged. And it's bad enough and hard enough having the acknowledgement and the support structures in place when that happens to, to women or anybody that's born or assigned female at birth or, or identifies as female. But it's ten times harder for those that 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 identify as male, and and I suppose a lot of people would possibly challenge me in that because it seems quite literal that I'm pulling that and figure out the air. But the basis for that, and I suppose one of the issues that that I'm very aware of, and one of the reasons we're doing the podcast series we're doing just now in terms of episodes is that moral injury element, and I think that's the part that people would probably call most question why we're relating the two. But I think it's also really pertinent to understand in terms of the impact of military sexual trauma, yeah. because it is different. It most definitely is because of the nature of the community and the structure that sits around it. So I suppose I'd be really interested in terms of your views on that too. Well, well absolutely. And, uh, I think we've done some really good work uh, actually getting women on the government and the MOD's radar, and I'm really proud of it. Uh, our uh, input on that, you know what I mean? One of the best things we ever did was we were able to set up Salute Her UK. And at the time, people said, why Why are you setting this group up for women who've experienced, who claim, sorry, it wasn't even of experience, it was who claim, they wouldn't even accept that, but who claim they've suffered sexual trauma in the military. And we said, because there's, there, there appears to be a need, you know, the trauma I thought it was going to be, which was uh, through combat, through Iraq and Afghanistan, there was a little bit of that, but the trauma that was predominant trauma was uh, military sexual trauma as a result of sexual assault in the military from your peers and colleagues or sometimes your superiors. So that that was really interesting and people people struggled with that, but... I think Salute Her, like I say, now has been going two years and there's close to 5,000 women on the books, uh, all of whom in some way or other have experienced some form of trauma. 
in the military, uh, predominantly sexual trauma, is the word, sadly. Uh, but that's just extraordinary. So there's a real unmet need there. And I'd always felt there was probably within that an unmet need for male survivors and victims. And it's very different. So women become very vulnerable when they join the military, especially if they're wanting, especially during training. That's that's the that's the key point really, is people can exploit their positions of power and authority and get people to uh, do things that people wouldn't normally do in order for the for the recruit women at that point to pass out. Uh, and the male stuff was very different. And the male stuff was the trauma came from uh, sexualized or humiliating, humiliation based uh, rituals, uh, ritual ceremonies, or uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, well, initiation where, rituals. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that's where the term red ass comes from, isn't it, Tony? Yeah, well, you, you, there's lots, and and mm. it's on a on a continuum of just like bullying at one end, which is horrendous, if you like, you know what I mean? And the whole troop turning on one person who isn't doing enough. And but I talk to people now and they're still traumatized from when they were targeted as the failing individual in the troop, right up to really horrendous sexual assaults that were supposedly put in place to help create unit cohesion and uh, these sexual assaults were were at the time viewed as character building. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hasten to add that most of the people who say that these these assaults were character building were the uh, uh, passive bystanders, active bystanders who did nothing, not the victims, uh, and potentially the perpetrators who thought that as well. But it's really, it's really complex. And then if you look at that from the men and the women, what runs as a golden thread through that is the institutional betrayal, which is where your moral injury taps in. So the institutional betrayal of A, not being believed, uh, B, uh, the problem located with you. It was something you did, something you wore, you were drunk, you didn't fit in, so you had to be taught a lesson. So it was all the problem was located with them. Even worse, if it was located with them, they moved the victim and the survivor. And, and in some instance, in fact, more than should be, uh, the perpetrator was promoted. So this is even worse. So that was, the, again, another moral injury for the survivor victim. Of why won't nobody believe me? Disbelief was another big issue uh, for the survivors, which is all fits into the moral injury narrative. And a sense that the victim survivor didn't matter because there wasn't any support services put in place. Mm. So people were left to get on with their own trauma Mm. and difficulties. And as a result of that, uh, years later or not long after that, or medically being medically discharged, uh, they they continued to suffer not only quite quickly afterwards for some people, especially the women, uh, but for many, many years after. So I think the oldest one we've got them in is 76 and his assault happened when he was a boy soldier in the late 70s. Mm. Wow. That's, yeah. Go back to what you're saying, Tony, I think a lot of it is, or used to be, I don't know about initiation ceremonies. Than that well, it's still there. Yeah, probably <laughs> it's are. Still there. And it's a case of, it, if it happened to me, it happened to me so I can do it to you. Yeah. Because that perpetrator re, you know, recycling what's gone on previously. Yeah. Yeah, 100, 100%. I think, you know, if you're the victim, unlucky, do you know what I mean? If you're a, a, an active bystander and you're just watching it, you're probably thinking, God, it's not me. But then the perpetrators or perpetrator will expect the active bystanders to do it next. So you're right. It's like it's like a rite of passage for mm-hmm. everyone. And, um, Almost generational. Oh, it is. I think it is. It's almost generational trauma. And I would also call it a cultural trauma that may or may not, people will shoot me here for saying this, but I think that that culture of uh, misogyny has maybe transferred into the police or the fire service or the ambulance service when we hear these horror stories of what goes on in other uniformed services. So it, it has got, it's got a long legacy, not only for the survivors and victims, but it's it, this whole perpetrator thing and this, this culture, uh, toxic culture, has got legs and it moves. I also hear a lot of horror stories about how people are treated Oh. And the response they get when they do actually disclose. Mm. And one I hear regularly is 
but we've got maneuvers at the weekend and that means I've got to segregate you and that will be really awkward and impact the performance of the, mm-hmm. of the unit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's almost kind of like, how dare you? Yeah. So you so you will go, you will go on this operational... Uh, with the perpetrator. With the perpetrators in charge of it and we'll deal with it when we get back, if at all they ever do. So it's, as you said before, it gets it's brushed under the carpet, it doesn't get dealt with. But we know, we know we're know we all human and those issues will uh, bubble away and something may happen again. And so, I th- I th- and I think that... And I think that's the other thing. When if we make those links with moral injury, there's an awful lot of self harming goes on as well uh, with victim survivors. Do you know what I mean? A to get away from the individual, but you know to physically self harm yourself just as a way of trying to cope with the dreadful experience and the trauma that somebody else has told you doesn't exist yet. You're trying to live with it every day. Is 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 terrifying. And we've just we're doing some research at the minute around looking at the impact of military sexual trauma in service uh, or sexual assault in service uh, and then suicidal ideation. And so far, I don't think we've got anyone who says, no, it doesn't, it does not make you not think of suicide. Suicide is always a vivid and regular thought pattern and option for people who experience this. Yeah. So I did my driver training yeah, uh, Leckerfield, Driffield area, and there were a few ladies there from the RLC. They were due to go to Deep Cut, yeah, and they were absolutely petrified. They wanted to sign off. Yeah, they were not allowed to sign off because they had gone so far through their training. They weren't weren't allowed to leave. Yeah, they were absolutely yeah terrified. Well, uh, there's a there's a whole other story, isn't it? And I and I if if there's ever if there's ever justice in the world, I think somebody should go back and uh, look at Deep Cut through the lens of military sexual trauma. And I think we would all be absolutely horrified at what went on. I mean, it was horrendous, horrendous. Uh, so I think I think if we went back and looked at that through a, a very analytical, almost forensic lens of military sexual trauma, we would we would be absolutely appalled. Uh, and it's interesting that you know we know there was individuals who were raped and who lost their lives, who lost their lives. So it's uh, yeah that that I still I still think deep cuts a, a wide open wound, uh, mm. and I, I don't think that I don't I don't think that that's going to heal up very very quickly at all. And that that what well, the whole deep cut issue is just horrendous. Well, I think I think in terms of the disclosures that have happened, it's the tip of the iceberg. Mm. Oh, one hundred percent. If we we started off with it was it, that's an interesting thing as well as when when we started off with forward assist and uh, we were working with women veterans and we called it the Salute Her Project. We had I think we had after about five years we had about two hundred and forty women on the books, and then COVID hit. And uh, two things happened. We got we employed Paula just before COVID hit. Although there is no correlation between that that, that world <laughs> pandemic <COVID. laughs> and, and Paula, I hate no ad. But she came to it with a very much. It was a really good mix, actually. It was a social worker going, let's let's care plan and let's care coordinate and let's put something together and let's do something really practical uh, with a mental health therapist. It was a really, really, normally we'd, we'd all sort of tolerate each other in professional sense, <laughs> but it worked really well. And uh, she brought that angle to it. And uh, because we were in, it was lockdown, we, we quickly went on, we started to do this and went virtual. And and her caseload exploded into about one thousand five hundred within. I think it was in within six months, mm-hmm. uh, which was extraordinary. And the demographic change. So the younger people who live on phones, who don't seem to look up when they're walking, they they were also uh, connecting. So it wasn't just the older veterans who you know what I mean who who, who access a lot of these. Uh, community-based services, which is what we were, and uh, so that that was fascinating to see that. So I think that that it's been a really good thing in the sense from this this you know online interactions and podcasts like this. This they're superb. They're a great way to get a message across and have meaningful discussions. Can I can I cycle you back a bit to mm-hmm. why we're 
we're arguing this element of moral injury within that because um, Rich and I, we've talked extensively about the military values. We've mentioned about the impact in terms of, I suppose, people's decisions in joining the military, that quite often that is about seeking the stability, the community, the family that they might not necessarily have in their in their pre-military lives. And the, the structure, the, the almost inbuilt beliefs and expectations that you yeah. have of everybody that you serve with yeah. are part and parcel in a way of what then results in a moral injury when those are not met. And particularly so, Ali, with uh, sexual assault, bullying, mm -hmm. harassment, discrimination. So I can I can throw some good, they're not one under verbatim, but basically we've had people talk about how they were, you know, exactly joined up with those values, wanted to, wanted to be part of the team, and then suddenly weren't part of the team. And so were ostracised from the team because they reported something had gone wrong. Uh, somebody had assaulted them, which you have every right to do and in the civilian world you would be listened to uh, and, and acted upon, whether or not anything happened, but it, it would be acted upon. And so the, the, they talk about how, as I said before, the, the issue is located with them, but they also talk about the, the betrayal of their friends and colleagues, so people who that they were prepared to die for, if if in that situation they'd psychologically made that commitment going, these are my colleagues, these are my friends, this is my cause, if it comes to it, I will die for these individuals. And then those individuals, one of those or two or more, sadly, uh, sexually sort of rapes them, then they go like, hang on, what's going on here? This is this is not where I was. So there's a real sense of betrayal. And one of the... Was, no, it was an American lady. It wasn't one of ours. An American lady said, uh, on a similar podcast to this, she said, for her, it almost felt like it was incest and that she'd been ra raped by a family member because she was that close to the people that she thought were friends. And that, that, that's where you you bang into the moral injury bit there because you've suddenly gone from all these people who it's not just like your your senior personnel above you it's your colleagues and your friends and how they then turn them back on the individuals because they would rather stay uh, in with the the organisation and the institution rather than then, that's all about being the psychological safety, isn't it? Hmm. it what do you think, Tony? Then is that there's this, de this denial, there's this um, lack of recognition or not wanting to recognise what's going on, what's going wrong. What What do you mean, within the military? Or within the government? Yeah, so within the military, within the Ministry of Defence? Well, the Ministry of Defence, for some bizarre reason, do not want to adopt the term military sexual trauma. So military sexual trauma, if you use the American definition, uh, basically covers everything from bullying, harassment, sexual harassment, discrimination, uh, right up to sexual assault, uh, sexualized initiation ceremonies or hazing or they call it or the australians call it bastardization it's all the same thing we'd call it beasting wouldn't we sometimes where it just goes beyond the beyond the realm of is this doing anybody any good the uk for some reason do not want to do that and so america has accepted it used the term canada used the term australia used the term new zealand used the term to describe it. And for some people, there's a real debate goes on as well. I've spent hours in conversations going, is it the right term? Uh, but for us, it definitely is, because I think we're on the first step of that, you know what I mean? Some of the Australians are now going, nah, we should just call it sexual abuse, in-service sexual abuse, which of course it is. But then you go like, well, is it trauma? And I I, I like military sexual trauma, because I think it it it... <laughs> It captures all of those different ways that you can be traumatised by being uh, a victim survivor, ostracised, uh, betrayed by the institution that you joined up and, and are of the belief that was there to protect you. So we recently had a conversation with a group of women and I think two or three of them said that they felt 
really betrayed by the institution because it didn't protect them when, back to that point, they were willing to give their lives if it came to it, but they didn't feel protected by not only the friends and colleagues, but the institution itself. Well, if you think about it from a from a disclosure standpoint, if you are unable or you feel you are unable to disclose that this has happened to you, mm. there are layers then of further injury and trauma that are potentially there because that means that if you remain in the military, then at some point you may be in a combat situation with these individuals and they're the ones that are standing at your back. Mm. And oh, if you have a fight in front of you, of trust yeah. and you have no faith in the shared values yeah. then what yeah. is that well and that's a really good point and I think you've got there's, there's that element which is like God, well, there you're in the, you know what I mean well not only moral injury but like you suddenly question and everything you're supposed to be doing and what you're doing and then you know if you're looking at it from a point of view of retention in the military are you, have you got any buy-in probably not do you know what i mean would would, would you if if you don't get looked after at that stage it 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 cuts deep i mean you look no further than the lgbt community when look look at the trauma caused by those individuals who right who were kicked out of the military purely on the basis of their sexuality and yes there's an argument going they knew they shouldn't have joined up because they were gay but hey that's life not everybody suddenly wakes up and goes i'm gay today do you know what i mean it's like and even if they did so what do you know what i mean there's lots of other people who have joined for other reasons do you know what i mean but it's like why that stop you from being an active member of the military force you know it's kind of like what difference does it make well and it does it what do you wonder i mean we have one of the one of the best quotes to come out of the women research was when they said they were talking you know when we had this big debate about what are the barriers to engaging with mm -hmm. uh, women veterans and the women veterans were saying well i don't want to engage with mi military charities because one i might meet my perpetrator mm -hmm. two i might meet somebody who knows what happened to me in the military and was part of me being ostracized and 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 i don't know bullied and harassed and it goes on after service as well. That's that through social media. It's not just doesn't just end. And then you know you've got that. That's just horrendous. It just this this follow on bit of being betrayed, and I mean psychologically betrayed by everything that you could possibly mm. believe in it. And it's, it's quite a shock, really, isn't it? I mean, but the level of vulnerability that that leaves you with having to manage on a day to day basis. Absolutely. I can't, I can't wrap my head around it. It's just horrendous. Well, and that has an impact on your relationships, has, a, uh, has an impact on uh, intimacy with partners. Uh, you know what I mean? There's, if you t sp I spoke to, uh, no, I spoke years ago, we did a little straw poll with 54 veterans we were working with in a group. That's a big group these days. Wish I could get those numbers together. <laughs> these days, well, it was 54. And I asked the really weird question. I said, how many of you were in the same relationship that you were in when you were serving? And there was one person, one person. So a relationship breakdown, which is a significant event for anyone, uh, is is horrendous, but then we've got then again. This is what I'm talking about: looking at things again through a sexual trauma lens, and go. And I'm not saying it's all, but you know what I mean. Is there a percentage there whose lives have been absolutely destroyed, and their 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 relationships because of the trauma they're experiencing have been so damaged that they couldn't stay together and couldn't get through that. And then you've got the ones who self medicate with drugs and alcohol. And risky behaviours. Well, if you think about it, I'm going to pull it back to that issue of disclosure again. Because if you haven't disclosed that to anybody, then Shit. not only are you still in an environment where you feel fundamentally at risk because this has happened to you already, that you have no sense of trust or faith. No. I'd also add on, Ali, as well, is if it's not recognised, how can you disclose something apart from then going to the civil police? 
Well, yeah. exactly. And then if you're sent to the civil police, you're sent back to the military because it's out with their realms to address. Exactly. And, and so you get you get a lot of people, men especially, saying because half the time the therapists don't dig enough, d- dig deep enough. You know, they're more than happy to go. Where's where's your trauma come from? Oh, I was in Iraq. They're not gonna, they actually tell you that it's combat related because it's easier to say that than saying it's actually happened to me when I was 16, 17, 18, mm. 20, 21. There's this happened, and and so that. You, you're right about that bury and that and the lack of trust and, and trust in professionals is gone. We get phone calls occasionally where somebody will ring up from a charity in, let's say, Birmingham. That's not where it was. Uh, but And say, I've got a woman veteran here and she's telling me that uh, it, this has happened to her, A, B and C. Is she? Do you think she's making this up? God, no. I hear that 10 times a day. No, what she's described there is exactly what happens. And they go like, wow. And oh if God. you haven't disclosed it to anyone, including your partner, yeah, the impact of that has to have ripples in your relationships because how much of that are you suppressing, trying well, desperately to deny that you cannot speak about? That it's yeah. a pressure cooker. Yeah, well, it's that old body keeps the skull thing, isn't it? So the amount of people who tell me they have physical ailments uh, that they can't actually pin on uh, an uh, an accident or an injury, but like, do you know what I mean? It, it's a real psychological pain or a difficulty and a problem. And I, I'm with you. I think it's this the huge repression of this trauma and inability to share it with anyone that you trust. And the first, the first victim of uh, military sexual assault and probably moral injury is your inability to trust. And that what a horrible, horrible thing to actually lose in life, the inability to trust. And I still class myself as a trusting person. And then when you do get shit on from a hype by someone, do you know what I mean? It's like really difficult again. But I think to myself, well, no, I'm going to continue to trust because if I don't continue to trust, then it's where where are we? Do you know what well, I mean? Well, that's, that's you and everybody through that lens of suspicion, isn't it? Everybody's like, well, leave paranoia. Everybody's like to get me. Yeah, well. And who yeah. do I turn to as well? Because... That's your pain. If I'm just if in a corner, isn't it? Uh, yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, because if it. I'm if I'm not able to trust anybody or I'm suspicious of their motives, yeah, then the only person I've got is me. Yeah, and you will you will end up self isolating, and you will end up. Well, that's when the self harm kicks in. But you will self isolate, and you will be lonely, and you will. Uh, it's ever decreasing uh, circles, isn't it, with regards to your mental health and well-being, and it's it's really difficult, you know. To, and for the the women have talked about how uh, sexual inappropriate, you know, banter. I fucking hate that term. Excuse the language, right? Banter. I, I, banter needs to be banned as a term. There's nothing funny about banter and having fun because it's usually at the expense of somebody or a joke or whatever. And it, it's it's that bit that when people leave the military and go into work that they have real trust issues or lack of trust issues with their colleagues who make a joke or whatever and they think that it will end up being ultimately a sexual assault. Do you know what I mean? They may be misjudging that. They may not be misjudging that. Who am I to say? Do you know what but I mean? But if you've experienced they're hyper vigilant, uh-huh. and if you've experienced that sexual, yeah. that sexual, that that injury, why would you not think that that could potentially lead that way? Because this is now learned experience that says I now need to be an alert for this. Absolutely. And therefore, anyone in their right mind in terms of risk avoidance. Yeah. If they're they're in a situation where they're experiencing that, they're hearing that, of course it's going to escalate the fight, flight, freeze. It's going to put you into that hypervigilant state because the last thing you're wanting is to find yourself in that position of vulnerability where there's a repeat experience. Yeah. So that causes difficulty in the workplace. Do you know what I mean? Real or perceived. Uh, And... You know, I don't know about you, but when when uh, my adrenaline kicks in, it's it's not just for half an hour, is it? 
I'm a five o'clock in the morning person, just just as it's wearing off. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's really, and that's where we see a lot of the self harm people. The self harmed actually take that. I think it's releasing cortisone or something, isn't it? To actually overcome those those feelings of real anxiety. But whatever, it's it's it has huge ramifications on an individual's life. And the other favourite line from uh, a male veteran, he said, it might, I might as well have got a life sentence for this because I can't escape it. I can't get away with it. It but keeps part, coming to haunt me. Part of that moral injury is also what it does to your sense of who you are and oh. how you respond. Yeah. So... The men, the men, the, the what happens to the men is... is so a lot of the guys go, right, so, so let's say they were raped, the male was raped. Uh, they will then go, uh, if I tell people, will they, question, will, they, will they question my sexuality? If I was a man, I would have fought back to the death and there would have been a dead body in the room and I would have had to explain it, but I didn't. I froze. And then you've got even worse than that. You've got like a physiological response to being sexually assaulted and for some people may get an erection or some people mm -hmm. may, may ejaculate due in, a, due in a rape or an assault. And then psychologically, the physiological is taken over and psychologically you're going, does that mean there is something defective in me? And you're right, that identity question, they are destroyed. They're going, who am I? Where do I go from here? Yeah, and, so and not only, yeah and for the guys, the older guys were women, they, they want to just get the courage. And the ones who've done it, what a difference it's made. But they want to get the courage to be able to tell their kids mm -hmm. because they were emotionally unavailable for their children. Yeah. And, and I that, think that's that's a really important point because there's an assumption that actually in terms of the male arousal, that is automatically buy-in and consent. Is it hell? Exactly. And you enjoyed it. So the perpetrator... Uh -huh. Well, is it on. hell? It's purely yeah. and utterly physiology. Exactly. It's physiological programming and nothing else. It doesn't exactly. mean consent. It doesn't mean enjoyment. Not, and nor does all. nor is the orgasm a yeah. predeterminer of either of those. No, absolutely. And and then you're going like, so then I, not, not that long ago with somebody in a position of authority who will remain nameless, I was talking to them and they, they, they really thought until I put them right that this was a uh, uh, people who were sexually assaulted, and people who perpetrated sexual assaults were members of the LGBTQ community. And I had to point out, like, no, they're not. You know, ninety. Some research in America has pointed out that ninety-eight percent of male rape on rape uh, incidents, the perpetrator has identified as heterosexual. <laughs> And there's tons of evidence to back that up as well. Mm -hmm. So there's another myth just smashed out the window. Yeah. That's a bit power, that's, isn't it? I was going to say. Power. Well, power and control, there you are. Very rich. But that's, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's been about able to control and have that psychological control over that person as well as that physical power. Look yeah. what I can do to you any time. Yeah, the power, the power and control, as we've said, you know, it, what, what, what was it? I think we are on the defence committee, weren't we? And I, I'd said, said flippantly, and I should have done, I said, I'd said to the military, I said, look, I think we need to have a, uh, we need to start being able to, let's talk about sex, you know, the classic salt and pepper thing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not minimising it, I said, but we need to talk about because there are some people are so repressed in the military, they couldn't. And Paula pointed it out, I think, in two, three point nanoseconds later, going, Tony, we're not talking about sex, we're talking about the brutal rape of individuals, and she was so right to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that's... Well, it was such a good point. That's a discussion we need to have. This isn't about sex. Mm -hmm. Tony, in your research and talking to all people who've been through that experience, what would it take to make a cultural change within these institutions? Do you know, that's one of the things I ask. On, and when I, when I ask people to, and bless them, but you know what I mean, we have privileged access to people who trust us. And, you know, never, you could... I don't. I, yeah, I really would. I, I would not betray that trust ever, ever, ever. And so that we're lucky because we do that and we anonymize everything. And so I always ask that question: going, look, if we could, uh, you know, the classic, if we could uh, wave a magic wand, what would need to change to do that? And you know, we haven't got to a definitive answer on that simply because it is so complex. 
And it's just like in the past 10 minutes we've had, we've jumped from issue to issue to issue, from like, you know, moral injury, sexual trauma, trauma theory, to physiological, psychological damage, lifetime damage due to relationships. And it just goes on and on. Normalized behavior? Uh, Normalized behavior? Uh Yeah. It's like... Well, yeah, there, there's a there's a really good interesting topic. What is normalized behavior? You know what I mean? Who has the perfect childhood? Who has the perfect experiences? But but anyway, that's there. So but back to your question, we ha- we haven't really got to that. Other than it would be really good if we had adopt the term military sexual trauma, so we could immediately identify someone comes and says, "Rich, I've been a victim of a sexual assault." What do I do? And you go, right, I'm going to make a referral so you do that. All the forensic stuff you do through the socks, if, if even that doesn't happen when it's supposed to do. But what we're also going to do at exactly the same time is get you some a therapeutic intervention immediately for you now and afterwards. And, and we're, going to, we're going to do, that's the priority for the individual. And that's got problems because when you get to a legal situation, you, you're, 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 anything you're telling a counsellor, they can actually request for it to be taken to the judge. Do you know what I mean? So counsellors and people in the therapeutic world are held over a barrel uh, with regards to confidentiality of notes. So there's no, it's, it's quite, quite awful. But what what we haven't got, what we haven't got is a pathway. We haven't got a pathway to send people to look after the individual's needs, not just the system's needs and the institution's needs and the legal needs. I'm talking about the person. We have to get a system that goes, we are going to embrace you, we are going to believe you, we're going to get you sorted and we're going to look at this properly. And we haven't got that. We're a long way off. Do you think the first step is actually having those open conversations because I'm very conscious that part and parcel of the disclosure issue is actually recognising that actually, yeah, I was assaulted. Mm. I was raped. I was attacked. Because it's almost that, and that comes back to that normalisation element of the behaviour is almost so normalised, it kind of almost puts it in a different bracket so that that's another barrier to actually acknowledging that this has happened to you. And I totally agree. And and if we look at if you look at the Me Too movement, was really good, and I know there's been pushes in this country for a military Me Too, and I I push the men to you know mm-hmm. to play on the whole game as well because it's it's part of that as well. It's, it's wonderful how everyone's got people are collectively putting their head below the parapet and going, "Don't respond to this. <laughs> it's this mad man putting this information out to try and raise awareness." But the issue is the if you if you go back, they they. Uh, they don't. They don't. They don't feel listened to or valued. And there is a psychology around mattering. And it, you know what I mean. If I had a pound for the number of survivors who said we, we don't feel we matter, and right, so that's just a glib statement. If you just say, no, I don't feel I matter really, well, and then just let it go. If you dig deep into that. That that's a horrendous state of play, isn't it? To actually feel that you as an individual person do not matter because the behaviour and culture of a system has been so normalised that you 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 feel you don't matter. And the number of people we talked to who went through what's that Me Too movement and went, you know what happened to me in the military? I only now realise years later it was wrong. It was so wrong. And you, we, I get guys saying to me, Tony, it was the 70s, man. You know, it was different times, you know what I mean? Rape was normal then. Well, that, Rich, that, that, that's a line someone yeah. said to me. Uh-huh. Rich and I had a conversation a while ago with Lee Marks, and we were talking about male domestic violence, as mm. in men being the victim of domestic violence. And what was striking in that conversation was was a real-life experience that that Lee shared with us which was about a moment of acknowledgement where where it almost like it's so untalked about, so unacknowledged that there's almost like that barrier in your head that says it's impossible because it doesn't happen to men. So therefore I must be wrong. So therefore I don't put two and two together. I don't 
take those elements and, and equate that to this is this. Yeah. And I don't value enough myself enough to step outside of that. And I'm not brave enough to walk away from that. Uh, it, I mean, it, yeah, it's complex. It really is. Complex. Yeah. Well, and then the, other side, the other side, Rich, is you've got. So, whilst we had some guys who talked about, you know, I could never. Well, I could never uh, go to a military charity or ring up one. We had, we did have a guy who said he'd ran Veterans Gateway and he, he thought the guy on the other end of the phone was his perpetrator. Whether he not, he was or not, it's irrelevant. He thought it was and he disengaged from that as a process uh, and he was traumatised by it. And then, but you've got the other side, the other guys who go, yeah, I go back to reunions. I'm looking for that guy who raped me and when I find him, I'm going to kill him. So there's the other side of that. There's the you suddenly you've it's the American classic line, isn't it? Of hurt people, hurt people, mm -hmm. and you know, God forbid that ever ever happens. I hope his bark's worse than his bite, but you don't know because it's a really deep wound. Mm -hmm. Someone's yeah. life's been destroyed by it. Yeah, as we talked beforehand, Tony as well. Yeah, and you mentioned about the legal system. So effectively, what is being ignored is assault. Yeah. And what I was saying earlier was that there was, um, a, I'm sure it was a Scottish prince, but I could be wrong on that. When they went to court, the judge said, the law does not stop at the walls. Yeah. So what the military are doing, they are stopping the law at the walls or the, yeah. all of the Ministry of Defence is by ignoring and not recognising these problems that are going on. Yeah. And they say they're doing, and they say they've introduced a zero tolerance policy, and uh, but it's very much uh, training by PowerPoint, if that's not too old fashioned a term to use these days. But I think it's ticky box X, it's multiple choice, isn't it? In the event of someone coming to you and disclosing about sexual abuse, what would you do? It, and I mean, it's not the way you need to do something, you, you need to have these deep discussions because. Uh, you, you you do because it, it's multifaceted. You couldn't you couldn't possibly cover this topic we're talking about now mm -hmm. with, uh, on military sexual trauma and moral injury in an hour, which we're going to try and do. You couldn't do it. At the best, you can go right. That's really interesting. I need to research a bit more on this and have a look at this angle and that angle because uh, it is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. and it, 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 this just opens up that conversation with people, doesn't it? That's all this is for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's great we're having it because mm -hmm. most people ignore me. Most people see what I do and go, from the military community on LinkedIn, it's like, oh, he's done another one. Occasionally I'll get nice little ticks and occasionally I'll get a light bulb. I go, well, thank goodness somebody's thought about this. Do you know what I mean? But the military won't push it. And, it, you know, there's there's a, there's a collective guilt, I think, within the military because they know what happened. You know what I mean? They know things have happened in the past that shouldn't have happened. And by default, they're almost complicit by actually not doing anything. Do you know what I mean? Or they may be involved in it and they may have done it or they may have felt bullied into doing, becoming a perpetrator. You know what I mean? It's not as simple as going, oh, that one's a bad one, although they do exist. But other people are, are driven to do it if they want to remain part of the pack. And not be ostracized and kicked out of it. The or worst thing. Was, yeah. The worst thing for me was when Paula found out that was it 220 women from Sandhurst had been discharged when we had that big uh, episode over the, the sexual assaults that gone on there following the absolutely tragic, sad uh, Olivia Perk's death. Uh, and that when the women were reporting sexual assaults, they were getting diagnosed with, uh, I can't remember the new term, isn't it, but borderline personality disorder, and they're discharged with a, a label. Or a emotional unstable, un what? emotionally unstable personality disorder. Uh -huh. e exactly, and you're just going, at what basis have you worked that? And then subsequently, so some of the women Paula was worked with, they went and got another assessment, and they didn't have that at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're just going like... You, you can't keep doing this to people. No. I had a guy but, years ago told, told me, said, uh, I, said mm -hmm. I, I, the worst thing that happened to me was not getting going to war and getting medically discharged. The worst thing was getting a, a, a diagnosis for a personality disorder. I've never worked since. No, it's got a big impact. Yeah. How big is that rug and how big is that broom to sweep it all under? Well, 
I don't I don't think they can do it now, do they? I think they've been shamed into having to address, especially the women veteran stuff. And thank God people like Sarah Atherton exist, you know what I mean, who are thankfully leading on the women veteran strategy and thankfully uh, push that inquiry through, uh, which is the Atherton report, if anyone wants to read it, because suddenly women veterans were put on the map. And then you've got the great work that Fighting With Pride did to get the LGBT community on the map. Still a lot of work to go on there. There's a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. It's not going to get resolved overnight. Uh, that, and, then, and then way, way, way at the bottom of the list is you've got male victims who uh, really don't want to come forward. A lot of millions of reasons why they don't want to come forward and... You know what I mean, and it, it's difficult. But the more we talk about it, the more people might feel a bit, a little bit. Well, I think this is why it's so important to Rich and I that that we have this mm -hmm. this conversation, Tony, Absolutely. because because this has to this conversation has to happen. It has yeah. to it has to be out there because if it's not out there, then there's never a chance that those disclosure levels will actually get to where they need to be. That people who desperately need that help and support are able to come forward and say, I need help. 100%, 100%. And then get the help. Not mm -hmm. go on a waiting list. I mean, get help straight away. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's so important. I think, what was the American one? The American said, well, I think was it one in nine, I think. I, think it might, I might be wrong, but that might be civilian ones. But I'm sure it was one in nine men had, had suffered a sexual assault, do you know what I mean? Either before or during service. So that was a difficult one to marry up, but nevertheless, that's one in nine. So one in one in nine, and then so if you look at women are what 11, 12 percent of the military population. Uh, so if you look statistically at one in nine on the male numbers, we may be looking at a, an absolute tsunami of people well, who experience. well that's the ones who want to admit it tony isn't it that well yeah not. and people do, yeah and what we do know is in canada and america 80 percent of people don't report so they will not report for fears of retribution career aspects being destroyed reputational drives career, everything just horrendous they don't report but the thing i know about trauma is that actually you can kind of put a sticky plaster on it you can make assumptions over what the cause of that trauma is and where it's come from. But at some point, if you haven't actually addressed the root cause, the starting point of that, it'll resurface. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it'll come oh. back in a hundred different ways. Yeah. And that oh, yeah. root cause, that starting point of that has to be resolved, has to be healed. If it's not, you look at the ripples that you've got and the issues in terms of mental health support and the 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 big gap in provision there, and you think, I wonder how much of that is actually down to undisclosed root cause. Yeah. Whether that's a military combat trauma, whether it's another form of trauma, whether that's pre-military service or whether that's military sexual trauma. But mm. how much of that is undisclosed? And if it's undisclosed, how much is truly resolved? Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's why I think I started recently. I, no, in the last report, the mail report, I did talk about pathways to despair and deaths of despair and people not caring for themselves so they would smoke and drink and eat shit, fast food and not look after their health. Do you know what I mean? Ooh. Slowly. I call it incremental suicide because the, the mm. lifestyle is so poor because they've got such low self worth that they don't care about themselves, and then they'll have an early an yeah. early career. And I'm going to caveat what I class as disclosure, Tony, because I think a lot of people listening, if they're resonating with what we're talking about, might think oh, I'm not telling anyone. For me, that disclosure, what's important about it is that you acknowledge it to yourself and you acknowledge oh. it to someone, yeah. whether you choose. And whether it's right for you to pursue legal redress or whatever is entirely a personal question, entirely a personal choice. And you should never feel forced into doing that. But at some point, that's about acknowledging that this happened to you. Yeah. And it doesn't define you. No. And it, it, you know, that, that, for me, that's the... The key thing, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a bit like, you know, you need to sometimes go back and give your 
childlike self. If you were 16 as a boy soldier and you were sexually abused by your troop sergeant and you're now in your 70s and struggling with that, then, um, and that we have several people in that position, by the way, this is not one of, uh, you know what I mean? You, you need to go back and pat your child self on the back, give yourself a hug and go, look, you did the best in those circumstances mm. to come through that. Do you know what I mean? But you need, the, the, well, the fact that those guys are now are acknowledging it is a big, big thing. And it's a well, wonderful thing. To be able to go through all that takes a lot of courage. Huge. And, and, and a lot of internal strength as well. Yeah. Nice. And you don't, you don't have to be, you don't have to go public with it. Do you know what I mean? You know, you're, those footballers who were abused by people, the, the people who are going through the Catholic Church now, you know, the post office people with a moral injury, good God, you know what I mean? It's like you, you don't have to go public. You just need to find, you need to find some self-resolution in there that way you can actually go, that was out of my control. And I, and I think that's the tragedy for some of the younger ones. So if you're like me and you joined up from an area of, multiple deprivation and you have very limited uh, well, what you thought at the time you had very limited life options and choices and you join up and then somebody abuses your desperateness to stay in the military uh that that's hard that's really hard you know what i mean for people to try and come to terms with uh purely on the basis that they wanted to get some form of gratification whether it's controlled power or whatever whether it was sexual who knows what it was but it, you know it to 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 abuse the most vulnerable people in your organization and the people with no voice they still haven't got a voice have they? Mm. you know what I mean? uh so if to to do that you know is wrong and it's you know and if it means someone like me has just got to start shouting about it and putting out a meme a day to say this is wrong, but no, I'm not in a nasty way. I'm not even in a blame game. I'm in a, I'm in a raise awareness. Let's talk about it. This is, do you understand the long-term impact of what this has on people? Uh, because I do think we could, we could resolve it if we got outside people in to train people and we had real pathways in the care and support during the time, at the time, during I don't know, if there is going to be a legal case, like you say, during that time, how vulnerable must you feel then? Uh, and for the, probably for the rest of your life, if you need it. I suppose that's about looking at the whole pathway and reassessing the support that's required to enable that. Yeah. Only from an addressing and changing the culture piece, yes. but also about allowing somebody to pursue the right course of action for them, whether that's therapeutic, whether that's actually I do want to make press charges and I do want I do want to do something there, but making sure that you've got the appropriate controls in place to do that in a way that is is they are comfortable with that's yeah. within their boundaries of acceptability too that doesn't inflict further harm and further injury. Yeah, and and that's back to that betrayal thing, and that's the moral injury, and that's like in any other setting in the world, you would be able to do it, and everyone would go, you're quite right to report a sexual assault rape. That person could go on and do that when they leave the memory. And I don't think that, I don't believe in one-off isolated sexual assaults. You know what I mean? I think it's happened before and it'll happen again. And so... You know, but they do that, and then the problem is located with them. They get a mental health diagnosis that's not accurate or fit in, but it actually meets the military's needs. The military are more bothered about protecting their reputation uh, than they are of the needs of the victim or the victim's families. There's another group that would just mm. uh, end up being a, a victim of this whole system that doesn't actually address issues. And careers have been destroyed when perhaps if people think they could be strong enough to deal with it. And several have said there would be if they got the right support at the right time, mm. that they would have they would have stayed in the military. I think, Tony, statistically, it's if somebody's get raped, within six months they're going to get raped again. Well, that wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me. There's, there's other great data as because well. Because people, can, people, people can, can detect that sort of vulnerability within that person. Oh, yeah, well, the Carl Castro, the uh, popular professor Carl Castro at the University of Southern California, he talks about it, about people who've been uh, sexually abused in childhood 
who joined the military and uh, are more vulnerable because of that. He talks about it, and it's a horrible term. I don't like it at all, but I can't think of a better one. And he talks about it's like there's blood in the water for the for the uh, the perpetrators. Mm. It's as if they can sense it, they can see it, and they will hone in on the victims. And I think. Uh, I think it I think he's, his research has proved that there's you're 35 times more likely to be sexually assaulted in the military if you've had childhood sexual abuse and that, that's 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 cool. and 33 times more likely if you're a woman to kill yourself you uh, see that also with things like um, coercive control and narcissistic abuse even with things like domestic violence where you tend to find there's an escalating pattern across successive relationships mm. Is very yeah. rarely a one-off, yeah. it, because there's almost like a, like almost like a default of these are the relationships that I I mirror and I match, and you you keep successively repeating that pattern. You know whether that's across your work relationships that then bleeds into your personal life that then bleeds into other areas of your life, but there will be patterns, and there's quite often that escalating pattern across that range of spectrum of relationships. I couldn't agree more, Ali. And if you look at if you look at some of the horrendous murders uh that have gone on or people who've ended up sexually assaulted, homeless people or people who've went on to join the police force and murder people and people who've sexually assaulted and abused homeless people. Uh and then you find out that there'd actually been uh, incidents in the military, but they've been found not guilty. What a shock. Uh, but they've then gone on to it in their second career and continued that pattern of behaviour. And then I don't quite know all the details about that guy who, uh, was it Sarah Everard, wasn't it, who got yeah. mm-hmm. Uh I don't know all the detail, but he was ex-forces. And you, you go like, well, what did he? Wait, hang on a minute. Put that. Let's let's look at a forensic lens with a military sexual trauma lens on it, and look at that again, and go back and see if there's a correlation. There may be, there may not be, but it just it just seems to be happening quite a lot that these patterns of behaviour keep turning up uh, with people. Uh, and we're talking about deaths. We're talking about um, deaths now. But I think the other important part, I'm just going to make this one point, Rich, if you don't mind, Mm. is that what I'm not saying in that, I'm not putting the blame on the person that's experiencing that. What I'm saying is that within that escalation pattern, sometimes quite often there's almost an overcompensation because it's happened once you overcompensate because you don't want to be that person that has that lack of faith, that has that lack of trust. So you overcompensate and you give more benefit of the doubt because you don't want to be that person that is that suspicious. And that's, that's an element where it's, this isn't about saying that you're responsible for that. Not at all. What it's saying is the experiences have a ripple and a knock on effect. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I agree, and that's a really good point because I'm not saying everybody would go on to do that, and ninety percent of people just internalise that trauma and have horrible experiences and and hurt themselves. Do you know what I mean? And live lone, very lonely, unloved lives, which is which is horrendous. Nobody should have to do that as a result of what happened here in the military. The other thing was when we did. We did the research in the women and the women veterans in the criminal justice system. What the key theme that came there was all those women that were in the prison all had multiple traumas. Mm-hmm. And if you if I put my social work hat on, every one of those traumas was an opportunity where we could have had an intervention to stop. stop. Yeah, to I, well, I, who knows it would stop, but it would have would have helped, uh, maybe slow down or stop. And uh, so there was, mo- and they never, none of these traumas the women had experienced had ever been addressed, and they hadn't been listened to, and they hadn't been, they didn't matter. And so, and then they ended up in prison, and then they've got the awful thing about having to come out of prison now and deal with, you know, reintegrate back into a community and, and and try and work through all that while the traumas have still not been addressed. So the trauma of being in prison, the trauma of labelling, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, when are we going to ever stop it? So that's why I'm really on about, really keen to get, you know, really quick, prompt access to real experience, therapeutic help and support for people at the very early stages. It's so important. 
And we haven't even talked about post-traumatic stress disorder, which, of course, fits in with MST, moral injury. All of it lead to if you need and have to have that acceptable diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, then, you know what I mean, because that's the one that might get you some compensation and support, uh, which is a tragedy. That That's the other thing. We shouldn't have to... I've hide hiding behind a PTSD diagnosis. And maybe that's a conversation for another episode. Oh, well, that is another episode because that that's a whole world of uh, that's another onion to peel that one is in an hour. But yeah, it's a it's a fascinating and it's a fascinating subject and I, I think I think as a as a social worker I think my job is really is is the welfare of the individual. If it's the welfare of the child is paramount, the welfare of the adult. And these are this is for me, in my head, this is just a big safeguarding issue. And and it's about how do we actually, you know, how do we look after the welfare of the individuals who come to our services and ask for help. And I don't care where they go and ask for help, just you know, we need a we need a better system and a pathway to get them to the, the right help in their areas. Uh, you know, because other, otherwise, you know, we, we just we'll be dealing with statistics, not people anymore, and life shouldn't be destroyed. Hmm. What are your key takeaways for anybody, Tony, who's listening in? Well, I think I, I, well, I'll tell you what, a really good key t- for the men. For the women, women are great. Women will talk to each other. Marvellous. Men, like me, don't really have much of a, an emotional vocabulary. So it is difficult, and it's very difficult to talk about stuff. Do you know what I mean? But I get that. But at some point, you know, you, you're going to have to trust someone, a close friend, and talk about it. It'll be like a weight lifted off your shoulders when you do. You know what I mean? But make sure you get the right person and the right professional to do it. I think that, you know, talking therapies are wonderful if you get the right people and not you know and if you if you've got a therapist and it's not working go somewhere else do you know what i mean that's it find the one that works for you never give up on things uh and, it, and it's about you know so the women are really good so they'll talk to each other they're they actually they're just fabulous and they're so articulate and and you know i, just, I listened to a group the other day and they were just extraordinary extraordinary strong powerful women who who hopefully are going to be leading on the training of the military as people with lived experience and putting their, and this happened to me and shouldn't happen, this, you know what I mean? But your system's all wrong and this is what needs to change. And that's what we should be doing. We should have, these are the people we should have going back in, fully protected and supported to go, this is what you need to make the system a better place. So that's really good. The men, like the first 30 we got through, that we wrote about in the uh, El Hombre Invisible, they're, mm-hmm. they're all connected to services in their community, not military ones. They're all connected to the right services. And that whilst it's like that, do you know what I mean? So you've got everything from homelessness to drug and alcohol to mental health to problems to... Oh man, you name it, they're they're on that roller coaster and you know what I mean, they're up and down, but they are connected to all the services and the services out there and there's great people who will help you uh, and you can get the help and support you need. Sometimes, you know, coming to an organisation like like mine would be great because I would I would I would love the your lived experience is really important to me to get in the report that I've got to write up about it. So if you want to share that with me and tell them and then have any ideas how the system could be better, totally confidential or go in, nobody will never know who you are or, or you know what I mean, where it came from, but so important. But the role of victim survivors is crucial if we're to change this, absolutely crucial. And the rest of them, the, the ones who are, the ones who are cover this up or are complicit and are more bothered about their reputations and their careers, then that that's that's an issue for them. It's you know what I mean. I, I it's I, I don't believe in it, but there's an awful lot of people out there now going, you know, this is wrong. We're, we're more aware of it. We understand it. Uh, uh, and and times are changing. Times are changing, and 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 it's much it's much easier for. Uh, for people to to access 
confidential therapeutic interventions. And a, a lot of the guys didn't ever even tell the families. They just looked as if they got better. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because they were they got to understand themselves so much more and, and weren't being so hard on themselves and cruel to themselves and hurting themselves. That's another one. That's another little manifestation of the people who go to the gym and train until they can't lift a weight again or run at the marathon. These what do they call these ones where they go ultra marathons? Oh yeah, ultra marathon runners who punish themselves as a form of therapy. I mean, it's great, oh, better than I, drinking, but they're hurting themselves. Well, I often think that um, self harm. Sometimes there is a a public perception over what that is, when in actual fact it can sometimes be a hell of a lot more nuanced and an awful lot more subtle than people actually assess. Well, oh, totally agree. And the, the other really interesting one is uh, the number of guys, uh, big guys, I mean, boxing champions who've been victims and survivors, uh, who've, ah, bless them, who, who put themselves in situations where they get beat up mm. as a way of... As, as a form of therapy for themselves because they feel so bad about themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hurt themselves, but they get beaten up. And uh, is that just so you're right? So the, these these nuances of, of what, how it manifests itself, and you know what I mean? And I, I've got an experience, honest experience where we were coming back from somewhere. Uh, on a trip, and this this guy wasn't, but there was something I missed. Him. And he went, and a rugby team pulled up, and the coach, and he went, "Come on, Tony, let's go and start a fight with these." And I was going, "I don't really want to." And he was going, "No, no, come on, we'll get the shit kicked out of this. It'll be great." And you, and the odds were like forty-five to two. Do you know what I mean? And he was just going, "Like, what is going on here?" But then the more I've done this work, the more you go, "Right, what, what, what?" See, is what trauma was that that he needed to, you know what I mean? We don't know. I don't know what it was, but it, it's it's true. It's real and it's interesting. Uh, but, you know, it's, yeah, the, we've just got to talk more about it and we've got to be open about it and we've got to accept that it happens, but we've also got to be really more accepting of, and we need to make sure that we, we keep the victim survivors safe and as best we can and get them instant access. If they want a compensation, go down that route, do what you want. You know what I mean? You're more than entitled in my book. You know what I mean? If somebody let it happen to you, but we've got, we've got, to, we've got to be more caring. We've got to be, uh, more nurturing of people and supportive of people when they come forward. So, long do we continue the conversation, Tony? Because I think... Sorry, I missed that. Long may we continue the conversation because that's... We have to. We have to. And uh, I think I... Especially with the, the moral injury one. And then you've got the survivor guilt bit as well. You know what I mean? And then you've got other ones who've got like really severe compassion fatigue, you know what I mean? Which is part of their compassion fatigue, but also real fatigue in relation to everyone else. Uh, and they live in a strange little bubble where they, 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 they go like, well, I could happen to me and there's no wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> and you go like right okay then well you are you are lit you're homeless at the moment and this might be a subtle hint do you know what i mean but it's like it's like this peculiar thing isn't it the little protective little voices we we give ourselves so thank you so much for giving us your time today tony i really both really appreciate it i'm sure we we'll have a conversation with you another time i can i can i can any time at all. If anybody wants to read any of the reports, please don't get triggered by them. There is trigger warnings, but they're all on the website. Uh, that includes men, women, LGBT community, uh, all themed around military sexual trauma or trauma uh, or injustice. Uh, fill your boots. And if anything has resonated with the conversation that we've had today, then please do reach out. Definitely. Make sure, for instance, Tony, that, that your contact details and your organization's contact details are in the show notes or in any social media we do with this episode. So that yeah. yeah. No problem at all. Great to meet you. Lovely to talk. Hope it helps. So do we. Yeah.
Have a great day then. Yes.